Hello. Um, I just first want to say what an honor it is to be here. This is an incredible opportunity. There are amazing, inspirational uh, speakers, even just the journalists have given me uh, goosebumps and everyone today, so it's a true honor to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a, uh, with a film, two minutes of a film that I did on the issue of child marriage, and essentially this is... Um, this is what I do through my photojournalism. During sex, I was crying and begging him to stop, but he didn't listen. Then he put his hand on my mouth like this. I couldn't breathe and I was crying, but he used me anyway. And I just cried. My ears is eight. The practice of child marriage is common in many parts of the world. It's not exclusive to any particular religion or society. Despite laws that forbid it, long-held cultural traditions die hard. If the current trend continues, more than 100 million more young girls will be married over the next decade. They were decorating my hands with knucks, but I didn't know they were going to marry me off. Then my mother came in and said, come on, my daughter. They were dressing me up and I was asking, where are you taking me? They just said, come, come. And then they performed the wedding. So I thought a lot about what to talk about today because this issue um, is, is quite a huge issue that spans more than 50 countries around the world. Um, but uh, so I, I thought the best way to do it would just be to explain why I've continued working on it for so long. It's been 10 years now since the first girl um, that I met was uh, the first girl I met who was an underage bride. Her name was Marzia, and I met her in Afghanistan. She was. Uh, 15 years old, and she had been married at nine years old and had unfortunately decided to um, set herself on fire. And at the time, my assignment was simply to, um, they were, we heard that there was a, a cultural kind of some sort of phenomenon happening where girls were setting themso themselves on fire in Afghanistan. And so we went over there and, and checked it out. And, and I just couldn't believe that this was such a horrific act that they would choose um, to do. And it's, it's definitely a suicide attempt. And so as a journalist, I felt like it was really important to look beyond the reasons, I mean, beyond this act and just draw attention to this horrific act and look at some of the things that might lead to this. There are many reasons that lead to this, but one of them, it was a common denominator, and the girls were so traumatized that they were not able to really articulate it themselves, but a common denominator was many of them were married underage, and by underage, I mean prepubescent. So, um, and I saw this over and over. Marzia was nine, another woman named Rakshana was married at 10. Uh, you know, it just kind of went along those lines. So I started to look into um, the different 
resources that were out there for young girls who were married um, or ran away from marriages or were in this situation. And I met this girl named Mejgon, and she was a beautiful, beautiful 15-year-old girl. And, I mean, you're, she's crying in this picture, but, you know, she was just so warm. And, and I was really moved by her because um, just shortly before this picture was taken, we went into that room behind and we just were having a conversation and she was, tears were flowing and she was just completely just telling me her story and just so grateful someone was listening to her. It turned out that she was married at 11. Her father sold her for opium and she was the second wife um, and was basically a slave in their home until she escaped. So this is in Herat, Afghanistan, and she was eventually sent back to her, uh, her father because there wasn't really anywhere else for her to go. But, um, but she was happy to at least be away from her husband. The thing that struck me the most in, in kind of the moment where I decided that I would not, that I, that I had to continue working on this issue of child marriage is she said to me, in my whole life, I've never felt love. And I believed her, and I felt like, what a horrible thing. How could somebody go through this world and not feel loved? And it was something that I, I couldn't imagine. And, it was, and, I, and I knew it was true for her. And so I felt like, okay, then I would continue working on this as long as it was happening. So as I continued my work on this project, I started in Afghanistan but went to other countries. So here um, I was in Kandahar with, uh, and met a woman named Malalai Kakar. She is or was a police officer who had been working on women's, defending women uh, in Kandahar for 25 years. And she knew of my project and she said, there's no way <laughs> you know, you're going to be able to do much on this. It's so hard. But then she got a call. Um, or about this case, and, and, this, and this is actually a 15-year-old girl who has two ch had two children already. And she had been stabbed by her husband for just trying to visit her in-laws. And Malalai called me and she said, you need to come over right away. I want this to be, I want this to be seen. And, um, and, I was, and I was worried for Malalai because she was, obviously she had her headscarf off. She was kind of, you know, strutting and very proud. And I said, I said, is this anything going to happen, happen um, to this man? And she said, no, men are kings here. There's nothing we can do, but you can take his photograph. And so I did, and we published this. Um, and, you know, she continued to fight for women's rights. And uh, she was eventually murdered by the Taliban, but not necessarily because of this image, but because she stood up for women for so long. So this is, um, this is so I, I, I began to start going into the villages and looking for the cases where, that I had heard these types of cases existed where the men were much older and the, and the girls were really young. And, I, and I, I, will grant, I will grant you, this is not something that happens, um, you know, it is, it's not, you don't see this as much in Kabul or, everywhere, but this is definitely happening in the rural areas. And, um, and I found this uh, young girl who she was actually in school. So some of the stuff that we were doing that was the right thing to do um, was working. And so she was in school, but she was taken out of her marriage, uh, out, of her, out of school during her, when she was engaged. So um, I'm going to go through the next uh, couple of images kind of quickly, but I wanted to point out that like you know, the, the statistics are crazy. It's like 39,000 girls are married every day. So while we're here today looking at this, 39,000 girls were married. And while we're tomorrow when we meet, there'll be another 39,000 girls. And this happens every single day. Girls are taken, they don't know where they're going. And in one case, they told me that they cover them up so the girls don't know how to find their way home if they decide they don't want to be there. So it's really important that we, keep, we address this issue. I will say um, that there is good news. It is getting better. When I started working on this issue in 2003, it was, I couldn't get anybody's attention. But we've gotten it published through the years in more than 100 publications now. And the elders and Archbishop Desmond Tutu have taken this issue on. 
and he is uh, there on a campaign with a group called Girls Not Brides, um, uniting all these organizations, including our project, Too Young to Wed, uh, to deal with this issue on all the different ways that have been mentioned over the last couple hours of ways to deal with human rights issues. So that's really exciting. And they feel like you know, this can be solved within a generation. Um, the other part of good news is there is, uh, as things get better, there are girls who are getting divorced. And this is a young girl who was married. She, her name's Najud. She's from Yemen. She was married when she was 10. And uh, she, you know, had an amazing amount of courage and went and got a divorce with the help of a female lawyer. I just came back from India about two weeks ago and found out um, there were 25 kids in, over two, in two villages that had refused uh, their marriage. Um, and uh, uh, just like Arzina had. And that's why this morning when I was watching her talk, I was like bursting because this was something that wasn't on the agenda before and it is now. So the last thing I want to say before I go is the reason why I'm, I've worked on this project and something everyone should know is that there's no difference. I, I hope you can see yourselves. If, if you're women, you can see yourselves in these girls. If you're, if you're not, you can see your daughters or your sisters. There's no difference in them and us. They were just born into a different situation. And they know, you know, we, they've asked us to tell their story. And we have to use everything we have, whatever talent that may be, to stop it. And um, this is what I'm trying to do. And I urge you to please use your resources as well. Thank you.